Hello, it's Stephen here, and today we're going to talk about a summer phenomena that you can see in the evening sky, and that is the wonderful noctilucent clouds, or night shining clouds. And I'm joined once again by my good friend Steve Owens, astronomer at Glasgow Science Centre. Hi Steve. Hi Stephen, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for inviting me back, and great opportunity to talk about these very topical objects we're heading into noctilucent cloud season. Indeed. And uh, I just got um, confirmation, actually, that up here in the Highlands, uh, last night, um, uh, some clouds were observed and just on time. I think the general time frame for seeing these tends to be between May and August. Yeah, and that's to do with the, the fact that the sun has to be a certain uh, distance below the horizon uh, for a long enough time that these clouds become visible. Yes, and the altitude of the sun is going to depend on your latitude. Now, I'm a couple of degrees further north than you in Glasgow, Steve. I tend to notice them at the very end of May. Is that your experience in Glasgow? Or yeah, how... I mean, the, the, the extra couple of degrees north that you have means that it's slightly better and easier to observe these things uh, where you are rather than down here uh, where I am. Not just because you've got darker skies than we have down in Glasgow, but because... Um, in the, the North Highlands of Scotland, you've got this situation where the sun spends a long amount of time at exactly the right band below the horizon to illuminate these clouds from underneath. So I, I can see them down here. I've seen them from further south than here. In fact, you can see them down to about 50 degrees north, so um, well into, into England and, and uh, northern Europe. But it's, uh, it's easier to see them, I think, up where you are. Yes, and I think the sort of upper... Um... A bound on that is about 65 degrees north which is a few degrees um, above Shetland. Uh, once you go further north than that the sun just doesn't get uh, low enough below the horizon. The sun is effectively um, set when we see them Steve and it's kind of shining up um, and lighting them from underneath because I believe they're at quite a high altitude these clouds. Yeah, so these are these are clouds. They're water vapor, but they're not normal clouds. The clouds we see in the daytime um, and at nighttime are in the lower parts of the atmosphere, the troposphere and the stratosphere, the bits nearest the surface of the Earth. These are much, much higher than that. So the clouds we see in the daytime, we see them whether the sun is shining them or not. At nighttime, we can see them as kind of dark black patches, or if you're in a city, they're lit up by streetlights and they glow kind of orange colors. But these uh, noctilucent clouds are much higher, about 50 miles up in the mesosphere, I think. Uh, and they're only visible when the sunlight is shining, lighting them up from underneath while the sun is below the horizon. Yeah. And in terms of observing windows, then, to give people a guide, um, we're now looking at a wonderful uh, few images here from Kevin Williamson um, uh, from Aberdeenshire. Um, I think the rough guide is maybe about one to two hours after sunset or one to two hours before sunrise. That's right. And there's a sweet spot for them. And these are amazing images here. Um, the sweet spot is that the, the sun has to be at the right um, distance below the horizon to light them up. But at the same time, the sky has got to be dark enough that it's not drowning out the light from these clouds. So there is this kind of sweet spot band that you're talking about. But yeah, one or two hours before sunrise or after sunset is the best time to see them. You've got to get clear skies too. If you've got lower clouds in the sky, they'll obscure the view. Uh, and in general, the darker skies, the better. Although light pollution isn't too much of a problem in twilight. But if you live in big cities, maybe it becomes a bit more of an issue. Yeah, when I tend to see them, um, it tends to be um, very late at night, obviously. And I'll be looking out the window north. And that's when I'll tend to pop outside and have a look. I've also seen them when doing late night observing stints. So because um, it's so hard to stargaze up here, I might tend to head out maybe 1 a.m. or something to look at some bright stars. And that's when I'll tend to see them. And again, over towards the northwest to northeast in midsummer is the direction you need to look. And um, we have quite a few images um, from last year showing them with Neowise. And I think uh, that potentially is why we got so many good images because that was an astronomical object that people uh, were motivated to look at and then you get to see the noctilucent clouds as a kind of bonus. That's a really good point and uh, you can't expect just to stumble across these things you've got to make a little bit of an effort even if that effort is just staying up to the right time of night 
but the the more opportunity you make for yourself the more likely it is that you'll see them so getting outside getting out of your house on a, on a clear night with good northern horizons at the right time of night at the right time of year you're more likely to see these than if you were by definition if you were tucked up in bed at home what's fantastic about astronomy these days is the the network of people who are outside every night looking up and have access to social media that can tweet pictures or, or um, message links uh, about uh, seeing these, these um, phenomena. So it's much easier to get a notification that they're happening. So um, I keep an eye on things and I have seen them in Glasgow before. Um, I've only seen them, I think I've only seen them three times in total, not because they're particularly rare, but because when I'm stargazing, I tend not to be stargazing in the summer. Um, and uh, therefore I'm looking up at the sky least less often in the summer months, I suppose. Um, but I have seen them both in the city and uh, further north in the highlands. They are amazing things to see. I mean, they 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 look um, very delicate. They're very kind of fragile. This kind of herringbone structure, and you get motion in them. I, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen them moving. But I think you get motion in them too. Yes, and we have a a movie now just to see that. Uh, it's kind of like almost a wave like. Um dynamics here we can see within the, the cloud structures. Now this is obviously sped up. Um, if you took a time lapse you would be able to see this. Um, but if you were to observe them over a prolonged period of time you would certainly see them shift and go through these wonderful patterns. In terms of the composition of these clouds, now uh, you mentioned before they're about 50 miles up and that triggered in my mind uh, the fact that meteors um, tend to vaporize about that height because that's um, quite a thin region of the atmosphere. Um, is that what we think produces these clouds? What's our current thinking on that? Well, it's still a relatively unknown phenomenon. One of the things that stands out about noctilucent clouds is that they weren't recorded before 1885. That was the first year that they were recorded. Now, that could be because people just didn't see them or notice them. It could be that they noticed them but didn't think of recording them. But it is quite unusual that they seemed to start uh, being recorded at that point. That date coincides with the eruption of Krakatoa. And at that point, maybe there was a lot of volcanic dust in the upper atmosphere, in the mesosphere. And um, those particles of dust are perhaps similar to the particles left behind as meteors burn up in the atmosphere. But what we're seeing here is not meteor dust or volcanic dust. This is water vapor. We can analyze it with spectrometers and tell that it's, uh, it's water uh, crystals. So if it's anything to do with meteors and anything to do with volcanic dust, then those little particles of dust might be acting as um, little condensing points around which the water vapor forms and around which these clouds form. But they also seem to increase in frequency and in brightness in regions immediately following a rocket launch. So space shuttles and rockets fly that high, our aeroplanes don't. Um, and when the exhausts of these rockets leave water vapor in the mesosphere, it seems like that increases the, the opportunity to see these noctilucent clouds. So whereas they might have existed before in a natural formation, perhaps our um, our artificial efforts about putting water vapor in the upper atmosphere are causing them to be more prevalent these days. Well, thank you very much for that chat, Steve, and good luck. I hope you get to see some down in Glasgow and to everyone listening and watching this clear skies and I hope you also get to see some of these lovely high altitude displays.